Hey guys, it's Dan from Shasta Above Adventures, and this is going to be a little different video than what I usually post. I used to own a t-shirt that said, my sole purpose in life may be to serve as a warning for others, and it's with that hope in mind that I wanted to share the story of what happened on my last backpacking trip that could have gone really wrong. As it was, it resulted in a forced evacuation and a visit to the ER. Now, this trip had been planned for at least six months, and I was really looking forward to it because it would be the first time that Chris and I were able to go hiking with our mutual friend from work, Eric. Even better, we decided to, to go to the Belly River area in Glacier National Park, probably the place I would choose if I could choose on where in all the world to be buried. It's that special to me. I just love it there. Unfortunately, I can't share video of the trip because of the weird laws that are currently in force forbidding any filming of any kind in national parks if that video will be posted on social media in a way that might make money without this super difficult to obtain permit. I wasn't willing to risk the $1,000 fine, but oddly enough, it's completely legal to share a few still photos here, so here's some eye candy. The first day went great. We made good time hiking in from Chief Mountain Trailhead, which stands just yards from the Canadian border and along the Belly River and past the Gable Creek Ranger Station six miles in. It started raining and the trail quickly turned muddy, but we didn't mind because we were just so happy to be out there. We stopped to fish in the huge pools at the base of Dawn Mist Falls, and I saw something I've never seen before. Eric actually caught two fish with one hook. <laughs> he was reeling in an eight inch grayling when a 15 inch bull trout latched onto the side of it and wouldn't let go. So that was truly amazing and it seemed like a great omen for the rest of the trip. The rain stopped as we hiked past Elizabeth Lake and we spotted a black bear just as we were arriving at Elizabeth Lake Head where we would be camping for the night. So far, so good. We ate dinner out on a sandbar where Chris caught even more fish and we all enjoyed the sunset. For dinner, I ate a bagel with summer sausage and sharp cheddar cheese which was so dry and salty, I washed it down with an entire quart of water. That detail will be important later. We set up camp and hit the sack, although I had kind of a rough night because I had to get up so many times during the night just to pee. This is the point in the video where I should give a little warning. I'm going to be talking very frankly about urination from here on out. So if you're squeamish about some such things, this is the point where you might want to tune out. So I actually counted eight times of having to get up that night and every time the same four things happened. First, I felt this extreme urgency, so no chance of just rolling over and hoping for another hour of sleep. Second, once I did get up and stumble out into the woods away from camp, it was very difficult to get the flow going. And third is that I felt this sharp stabbing pain in the lower abdomen area whenever I was bearing down and trying to push. Now, if you imagine a spot about six inches below the belly button and maybe six inches deep inside, that's where the pain was. The fourth thing was I could only keep the stream going for a few seconds, so the bladder was never really getting completely empty. Little backstory here, uh, I had been diagnosed over a year prior to this with an enlarged prostate, technically called, get this, benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. And I had been getting by just fine all this time with medication. Now the prostate is a gland about the size of a ping pong ball and the urethra runs through the middle of it, kind of like this pen. When the prostate is enlarged, it pinches off the urethra, causing a person to experience low flow, which then leads to urinary retention and having to go frequently. There was just one other time when this had happened and it was on my last backpacking trip, the one to the Snake River. 
didn't mention it in that video because why would I, right? Uh, I had a similar bad night then, but the next day was normal and no further problems beyond sleep loss. So this night in Glacier sucked, sure, but since it had happened before, I just chalked it up to a bad night and figured I'll be fine in the morning, just like last time. That belief led me to make a really bad choice, which was to drink my usual cold coffee with breakfast. Now, if you've noticed in my other trip videos, that's nearly a quart of coffee. And my poor overworked bladder said, that's it, I'm on strike. So after breakfast, I wasn't able to pee at all, despite feeling the same level of urgency and a very full bladder. Chris and Eric were having fun fishing again on that sandbar where the stream entered Elizabeth Lake and were begging me to give it a try since I have such notoriously bad luck fishing. And they were literally pulling out fish with every cast. Unfortunately, I was too uncomfortable even just to stand in one place. So I explained the situation and suggested that I start hiking with the hopes that walking would massage the bladder and help to get the flow going. To their credit, these two great hiking buddies immediately offered to end the trip and hike out. After more discussion though, I really believed that the situation would remedy itself with time and movement. So I started hiking down the trail towards Helen Lake which just happens to be two and a half miles in the opposite direction of the trailhead. Well, that didn't fix the problem. Although I really can't regret hiking to Helen Lake because, oh my God, it's absolutely stunning. And I certainly intend to return sometime when I can spend more time there. Eric and Chris caught up to me just as I was leaving Helen and still hadn't peed at all. It was now 1.30 in the afternoon and becoming a more serious problem with every hour that passed and no action. Now, Eric is a physician's assistant and you couldn't ask for a better hiking buddy in a situation like this. Not only does he maintain a great attitude, but he had downloaded to his phone every medical tome that might be possibly useful in the backcountry. And by then he had researched my problem and came to the conclusion that if you can't pee at all, it's an evacuation situation. I couldn't believe I was in this predicament over something so ridiculously stupid as just needing to pee. It's such a natural thing to do. We really take it for granted and never stop to realize how important it is. So what can happen if you don't pee? Is it actually life-threatening? Well, the average adult urinates every three to four hours and it takes between 250 to 500 milliliters to feel full. Not being able to pee can result in urinary tract infections damage to the bladder from being overextended, and ultimately kidney damage. In extreme circumstances, it's even possible for the bladder to burst. Although, thankfully, that outcome is very rare. So yeah, possibly life-threatening, but really a greater concern is the longer-term damage that can result from urinary retention, if untreated. So we decided to hike out and abandon the second night out. I felt terrible for ruining the trip for my friends, and to be honest, being able to bail on a trip without guilt is one of the reasons I usually hike solo. But Chris and Eric were completely gracious, not to mention patient, as I had to pull off the trail about every 15 minutes and try to go. Around two o'clock, I did begin to get a little bit of some small squirts, and then a stream, and then another little stream. And believe me, I was taking great joy from anything coming out at that point. But despite this improvement, it was nowhere near enough to actually empty the bladder, so we pushed on. Just for fun, it was also a sunny day in the mid-80s, and I was severely rationing water, not wanting to make the situation any worse. So in the end, we hiked 16 miles that day, and I drank just one liter of water and only ate one Kid Cliff Bar. Now, the very end of that hike involves an elevation gain of 800 feet, and it's a slog on a normal day. Hungry and dehydrated, with a bladder so painfully full I couldn't tighten the hip belt on my pack, I really struggled to get back to the car. Once we did, it was a three-hour drive home, stopping about every 30 minutes for a bathroom break. Eric wanted me to go straight to the ER, but since things were moving somewhat now, I decided to go home, hoping things would improve with a good night's sleep. But by noon on Sunday, I gave up and finally went to the ER, where they inserted a catheter and drained exactly one full liter from me. 
a thousand milliliters, twice the amount of a normal full bladder. I had to wear the catheter for a week, and then came the really fun part, learning to self-cath. Not gonna go into great detail on that procedure, but I'll just say the first time you do it, it feels a bit like stabbing yourself in the groin with a 16 inch knife in slow motion. <laughs> That's mostly psychological though, and I've become much better at the procedure with practice, although it's still something I avoid as much as possible. So why did I wanna make a video about this? After all, it's kind of embarrassing the thing to talk about, and I would really much prefer to keep it to myself. Well, I was inspired by Dan Becker and his willingness to make a video to share his experiences with rhabdomyolysis, which seemed to me a really good thing to share that information so people can be aware of a potential major problem. Well, I've been doing a little research and it seems that exercise-induced rhabdo is a fairly rare condition affecting approximately 10 to 20%. Guess what the prevalence is of in a large prostate? At the age of 51, it's 50%. At 61, the rate is 70%. Over 71, it jumps to 80%. It's been said that if men lived long enough, every single male would end up with an enlarged prostate. Now, according to my YouTube analytics, most of you watching my videos are men between the ages of 35 and 65, so that's one reason for talking more publicly about this extremely common condition. Chances are pretty good that this is something you're going to have to think about at some point. The other is just to let people know how suddenly it can go from being not a problem to being a huge problem. My urologist wasn't able to say what might have caused this, whether it was excessive liquid intake, the super salty foods, or even the rubbing of my hip belt, but it really did happen overnight. One day, everything was normal and fine. The next day, disaster. I was fortunate that it was even possible to hike out that day. If I had been in a more remote location, like the middle of the bob where I was days away, I probably would have been forced to call for help. Actually, I know now that the whole situation could have easily been resolved by using a self catheter, and this is what that looks like. It's just a simple, flexible tube, about 16 inches long, and can be found in any drugstore, which would just be less than an ounce of insurance to add to the pack if you're already taking medications for BPH. I don't believe I've ever heard of this being part of a backpacking first aid kit, but if you're a male over the age of 50, and especially if you already know about having an enlarged prostate, I know now it's a mistake not to carry one. And you can see, you can coil it up and fit in a very small space. Now, the first time you do that, you definitely want to be coached on how to do it. And it's a pretty simple thing to learn from your urologist. And by the way, I'll put a link to a really good instructional video in the description below. I also will invite you to ask whatever silly or embarrassing questions you might have about this condition or this procedure in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them from my personal experience. So what's next for me? Well, I'm afraid that my backpacking season is done. I probably could manage the situation now with the tools and skills I've learned, but since we never really came up with the actual cause that made things go so much worse so suddenly, it just doesn't seem smart to risk it. Of course, I'm really sad about that, but know that when I get back out there, and I will get back out there, it will be that much sweeter. I'm scheduled for surgery in mid-September and will be having a procedure called a laparoscopic prostatectomy, basically a rotor-rooter procedure in which they cut away the inside edges of the prostate to free up more space for the urethra. Once I heal up from that, you can bet I'll be back out on trail as soon as my new and improved bladder functions can take me. In the meantime, I hope to crank out a few more gear reviews, so watch for those. Okay guys, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.